celebrate the 2023 annual lecture put together by the of Nigeria CIBN. We are excited you are here. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, traditional rulers, captains of industry, we want to say a very big welcome. Welcome to the CIBN 2023 annual lecture theme. Unlocking the constraints in Africa's economic transformation, insights into the power of capital. Now, with a population of over 1.2 billion people in the continent, the potentials of this continent cannot be underplayed. Rich in capital, human, and natural resources. The very reason why we must have this conversation around unlocking the constraints to the continent's transformation agenda. Once again, I say a very big welcome to everyone here. My name is David Obabudike. I will be your anchor for this beautiful event. Uh, let me begin by welcoming everyone. In no particular order, I want to say a very big welcome to uh, the President, Chairman in Council, Ken Opara, PhD, FCIB. I also want to welcome the Chairman of the occasion, uh, Mr. Adedotun Suleiman, MFR. A very big welcome to you. Distinguished guest, speaker of the event, uh, Professor Benedict Oketukorama, CON. FCIB. It's a big pleasure seeing you in person, sir. Very big welcome. I also want to acknowledge the presence of guests. Uh, guest of honor, His Excellency Andy Yu Ping Liu, representative of Taipei Trade Office. So good to have you uh, with us this beautiful day. Uh, the managing director of NDIC, Mr. Asan Bell, uh, FCIB, and the executive uh, director of ENC, NDIC, ably represented. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. The president, CIBN, Pius Deji, or Larry Baju, PhD, FCIB, you are highly welcome to uh, the event this uh, beautiful morning. Uh, the national treasurer, CIBN, Mrs. Mujisola Asieru Bakari, FCIB, registrar, COEO, uh, Aki Morakio, HCIB. Welcome, gentlemen. Highly revered past presidents of the institutes here present. Uh, Chairman, Body of Banks CEO, uh, Dr. Ebenezer Onyago, FCIB, a very big welcome to you. Uh, the Chairman of the 2023 CIB and Annual Lecture Implementation Supervisory Committee and Group and Managing Director CEO, Fidelity Bank PLC, Mrs. Neka Onye, uh, Onyeli Ipe, FCIB, welcome to uh, this event this morning. Members of the CIB and Annual Lecture Implementation Supervisory Committee, uh, uh, Marine Director, banks and other financial institutions, we say a very big welcome. Distinguished members of the Governing Council of CIBN, we also welcome you this beautiful morning. All special guests here present, captains of industries and leaders of thoughts, uh, the past registrars, chief executive of, executives of CIBN, our regulators, directors of CIBN and the NDIC, we say a very big welcome. I see some of you here. I also want to say a very big welcome to the eminent members of the diplomatic community, uh, DGs and MDs, CEOs of ministries, departments, agencies, presidents of professional bodies here present. You are very welcome to this August event. Fellow associates, honorary senior members of microfinance, certified bankers, and all other categories of memberships of the CIBN. A very big welcome. Members of the academia, we see you here. You are also welcome. Uh, imminent members of the banking community, management and staff of CIBN. Esteemed audience joining us on the virtual platform from across the globe. A very big welcome. I also see some uh, traditional rulers here. I say a very big welcome to all of you as well. Gentlemen of the press, my constituency, welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very big welcome to all of you. I think it's a perfect place to give ourselves a round of applause. In spite of all the challenges that the nation's economy is faced with, we could still make it here 
and still have some smiles on our faces, I think we should at least applaud ourselves uh, for being here. We made it here. Welcome, welcome. At this point in time, I invite the President and uh, Chairman of Council, CIBN, Ken Akbara, PhD, FCIB, for the opening uh, remark. Can we put our hands together for the President? The Chairman of 2023 CIBN um, Annual Lecture, our own elder, Mr. De Dr. Suleiman MFR, the distinguished speaker for today of um, 2023 Annual Lecture, Professor Benedict Okechiku Orama, CON FCIB. The managing director of um, NDIC, MD of Nexim Bank here, the first vice president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Professor Larewaju FCIB, PhD, the national treasurer. Mrs. Mojisola Bakare, FCIB, the chairman of the um, body of uh, past president, the presented here, and other members of um, our referred past presidents that are here present, chairman of body of bank CEO, Ebenezer. The chairman of CIBN annual lecture, implementation and supervisory committee, and the group managing director of um, Fidelity Bank, Mrs. Onyal Ibe. Captains of industries that are here, Roy Fathers. The Christian communities, the Muslim and the spiritual fathers that are here present, managing directors of banks, former deputy governor of Central Bank, other guests that are here present. Let me not forget um, the representative of um, the Taiwan Trade Mission in Nigeria, my very good friend, His Excellency Andy. Please permit me to rest on um, protocol that the MC has observed. I'll go ahead and welcome you for this um, Great occasion. Be aware, the CIBN Annual Lecture is a public policy forum initiated by the Institute to acquaint members of the public with developments on topical issues of economy. It also provides platform for industry holders. This year's edition of the lecture is uniquely different because this year the Institute is celebrating its 60th anniversary of upholding professionalism in banking and supporting the economy. <laughs> Therefore, the choice of the guest speaker is very deliberate and I'm sure that the attendance today speaks to it. I therefore welcome you all to this event. Esteemed audience, permit me at this juncture to recognize the presence of the chairman of this event, a consummate professional business leader and the boardroom guru, Mr. Adedotto Suleiman 
MFI. He serves as the as chairman of board of companies, including Cadbury. We are very proud of you. You've dedicated over four decades of your life to the growth and transformation of business corporations in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. We appreciate your contributions and we are indeed honored to have you in our midst. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, the lecture of today titled Unlocking the Constraint to Africa's Economic Transformation Insights into the Power of Capital will be delivered by our distinguished guest speaker, His Excellency, Professor Benedict Oke Orama, CON, SCIB, President and Chairman, Board of Directors, African Export in Bank, Afrexit. Professor Rama is an ebullient scholar, a visionary, a transformational leader who has demonstrated creativity, enterprise, and commitment, ladies and gentlemen, under his watch. Afrexit has become a foremost driver of economic transformation through implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement after. Professor Rama has led the creation of innovative instruments to support the development of strong and interconnected continental financial system, working with the African Union and after Secretariat, Afrazim batted the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System to enable intra-African trade and payment in African currencies, paving the way for achieving annual savings of about $5 billion in payment charges by Africa. This is very, very important because if you have to make payment that you did transaction in Ghana, you don't need to talk about dollar. And that's what the Pan-African payment system is geared towards achieving. In Nigeria, the impact of Afrexim has been monumental. Afrexim has contributed immensely to strengthening the Nigerian financial sector and has supported the growth of the private sector. For instance, the bank recently commissioned the first African Quality Assurance Center in Ogun State, Nigeria as part of the initiative to develop world-class quality assurance center across Africa. This initiative is aimed at boosting the testing and certification of Nigerian goods for export, while ensuring that made in African products comply with international standards and technical regulation in order to promote export and facilitate intra and you know, extra African trade. The bank is also developing an Afrexim Africa Trade Center in Abuja, among other things. Your Excellency, I welcome you warmly to this platform. We are privileged to have you lead this conversation at this gathering as we look forward to gaining insights from your wealth of knowledge and experience. Let me use this opportunity to also congratulate you on the 30th anniversary celebration of Afrexim Bank. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that the theme of this lecture is appropriate and could not have come at a better time than this when our country is undergoing transition and is in their need of ingenious solutions to the various challenges confronting the economy. Currently, Nigeria is considered Africa's biggest economy, and this is why some people believe that Africa's chances of prosperity completely lie in the hands of this our great country, Nigeria. As economies around the world continue to struggle with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
sowering food and energy crisis, supply chain destruction, surging inflation, debt tightening, climate change, unlocking the constraint to African economic transformation at the entire continent. As you may already know, the African continent represents 20% of the Earth's surface and is home to about 1.3 billion people, which will likely reach 2.5 billion by the year 2015. It boasts of 60% of the world's arable lands, large swaths of forests, 30% of the world reserve of mineral, and the youngest population in the world. Despite these riches and impressive demography, many African countries are still characterized by widespread poverty and inequality, coupled with mixed effects of limited access to quality education, health, nutrition, technology, funding, and innovation. Failure to tackle this issue could deprive a whole generation of Africans the opportunities to maximize their potential. This implies that Africa needs to invest heavily in human, cap in human capital, education, skills, and entrepreneurial development to ensure that its citizens have the knowledge and skill to drive economic growth and development. According to a report by World Bank, successful countries with the highest level of per capita world globally adopt the highest concentration of human capital. Therefore, the tide of Africa's brain drain must be reversed by creating a world-class education and research infrastructure that will keep the best minds of the, in the continent so that we will um, prevent the so-called um, the Japa syndrome. As talent is developed across the continent, Investment in research, science, and innovation will increase dramatically across various sectors, including manufacturing, which will be a significant factor in helping Africa realize its development potential and narrow its income and welfare gap. To reposition Nigeria and indeed Africa on the path of economic growth and unparalleled transformation. The, critical, the criticality of capital cannot be overstressed. Access to capital will no doubt unlock the constraint to the economic transformation of Africa. I have no doubt that the idea that will be generated from this forum will no doubt assist policy makers, industry practitioners in formulating policies that will transform our economy and reposition our country on the path of economic prosperity. Esteemed audience, during my investiture as the 22nd President and Chairman of Council of the Institute, I unveiled the agenda. The future is here. A key component of the agenda focuses on trade and finance collaboration. In view of the great potential in the African continental free trade area, and the need to build capacity for practitioners in the banking industry. The Institute will be executing a collaboration and MOU with Afrebrim Academy to run a joint capacity building and certification program in the areas of trade and finance. That MOU will be executed today. It's also instructive to know that the banking industry is setting up a $20 million human capital fund for the purpose of grooming and nurturing a pool of agile, innovative, market-ready workforce for the Nigerian banking industry. Furthermore, the Institute is embarking on a banking school project that will be constructed on the East 26 acre of land in Ogun State and will serve as a melting pot for the training and development of new and existing workforce in the industry. 
distinguished audience. As I conclude, I want to commend the organizers of this program, particularly members of the Annual Lecture Implementation Supervisory Committee, ably led by the Amazon, the Group Managing Director of Fidelity Bank, Mrs. Neka Onyal Ibe, FCIB. I thank the team for the sacrifice of your time, the efforts, and energy in putting the planning of this event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you all to this special event. We definitely would have a very refreshing time. Please sit back, relax, and refresh yourself. Network, enjoy the rest of the proceeding. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Can we still put our hands together for Mr. President? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I had the privilege of uh, reading through the resume of uh, the keynote speaker, the lecturer for today. And I must say to you that um, let's get our notepads ready. It's going to be a loaded session uh, this morning coming from Professor Benedict of Rama. You know, I need advice right now. I don't know who can advise me on an issue that's bothered, bothered me all morning. Uh, my seven-year-old niece uh, refused to go to school this morning and I tried convincing her why she should go to school. And she says to me, my teacher is confused. And I said, how do you mean? She says, last week he came to me and said, four plus four is eight. The day after he says it's seven point plus one. Afterwards he says it's five plus three. She said, I'm not going to school until my teacher decides which one is the addition for eight. So, you know, this is our generation. Uh, let's put our hands together again for Mr. President. Uh, let, me see, let me just say a very big welcome to some of our past presidents. Again, I'm going to mention their name categorically. We have Mr. Femi Ekundayo, FCIB. A very big welcome, sir. So good to have you here. Uh, Professor Wale, okay, I hear we're expecting him. We have Dr. Shego Aino, FCIB. Uh, welcome, sir. And my very good friend, Dr. Ucholo, thank you so very much. So good to have you here again. I've also been informed that we have the, the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, uh, being represented by, uh, by the Deputy Zonal Command of the Lagos Command, Mr. Emeka Okoroji. I, got, I hope I got that right. Thank you so very much for uh, being a part of this event. Can we quickly invite Mr. Adetotun Suleiman, MFR, Chairman, Board of Directors, Cadbury Nigeria Limited, uh, PLC rather, for a special remark on the occasion. Let's put our hands together for the Chairman of the occasion. Let's keep the clap coming until he steps on the podium. These are pace setters. These are captains of industries. Welcome, sir. It's so good to have you this morning. Mr. President of the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria, uh, past president, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and most especially our guest lecturer uh, for today. Good morning. Uh, it's a delight uh, to be here um, to, to chair this uh, lecture. It didn't take too much convincing when I was told I, was, I would do this. Uh, I'm not really a banker, so when I started to a banker. But then I reflect that uh, most of my career as a consultant was actually consulted the banking industry. Most of it. As a matter of fact, I was naive enough to think that I could run a bank. <laughs> I actually did have that aspiration that when I retired from being a consultant, I want to sit on the other side of the table. Then something happened in 2005. So the little change happens, and then the complexity of the game changed totally. I just said, no, not for me. So I saved myself the trouble. And uh, no, fast forward to today, I don't know whether I would like to be a banker. Because I reflect on what's been going on in banking, I'm asking myself, wow, it cannot be fun heading a bank. I mean, how can a bank that's been in for 40 years a, systemic, a systemically important bank in the United States of America, the most sophisticated market, unraveling in 48 hours. 
how? How does that happen? I said that wasn't bad enough. Less than a week later, what I thought was impossible happened. The collapse of the of Credit Suisse. I mean, growing up, we are Swiss with stability. I mean, that was the epitome of financial stability. But the thing that struck me, most of all, two things that struck me from, what, from the events. Number one is the speed with which it happened. And then secondly, it shook the whole notion of too big to fail. I mean, if a bank was going to fail, I never thought it would be a Swiss bank. I never thought it would be Credit Suisse. And then there is a question in my mind, can it happen here? Can it happen here? Are there banks that are too big to fail? And if it's going to happen, will it happen like that, like it happened in the US? We, we don't know. Um, but uh, it's frightening. But the most significant thing, at least from, point, from a policy point of view, is the response of the monetary authorities in both countries. And how they've managed in a fairly swift manner uh, to contain the contagion. Because there was, a, there was great fear that it was going to spread, and we're going to see a repeat of 2008, 2009. That hasn't happened. I don't think we're completely out of the woods yet. But uh, we'll see how hard that happens. But I think there are one or two things we can learn as a country in terms of regulatory response to crisis. And I hope uh, the relevant authorities have taken note. Now, this morning's lecture is not really about banking, it's more about capital. And, um, and uh, if there's one thing that is holding us back as a continent, one thing, in my own view, is the is cap capacity of capital. We've, we've all heard about the statistics, you know, 1.2 billion people, 60% of arable land, and so on. Will you ask yourself, I mean, the continent of the future, the youngest population, what's holding us back? In my view, one of the things that is holding us back is capital. We don't have the money we need you know, to, to embark on the development challenges and address the development challenges facing us as a continent. Two things. Number one is that because of our historical, uh, you know, uh, where we are coming from, history, we are poor people, relatively poor people in, 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 mother, in mother terms. And over since independence, I would say capital form formation has also not gone as well as it could. So we haven't accumulated a lot of capital. I think we're rich, but we're very poor uh, relative to, say, the advanced uh, continents like Europe and America and all that. But more importantly also is the fact that Africa has not been as attractive to capital as you would have expected. Because my own fundamental belief is that capital always goes to where there are opportunities. And here we have an opportunity, you know, a continent that is brimming with opportunities, where we need everything, where everything has yet to be done. How come the capital is not flocking in? How come capital is not flocking in? Part of the reason, of course, is the fact that capital, even the, if you take all the capital in the world, it's finite. Put all the capital, all the surplus capital, you know, it's finite. And therefore, after nationals have taken care of their domestic requirements and they need to put their capital to work, they're looking for outlets. And it's a very competitive market out there. I don't think we have, as a continent, provided a conducive enough or a severely attractive or severely competitive environment to attract capital. And, for work, I want, and the little capital we attract comes at great cost because of that what I call relative competitive disadvantage. So it's a challenge for, for us as a continent uh, where to, what to do to mobilize internally as well as externally the capital that we require to surmount all the developmental challenges that confront us as a people, as a continent. I think that's where the lecture this morning is particularly apt. And uh, I just can't wait to um, 
to listen to, to our guest lecturer. And, the, and today to me is not only about the lecture or the subject, but also about the lecturer. I read his profile while I was waiting for this event to get started and I was kind of, let me say, I'm impressed, very, very impressed by all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with the role you played in the formation of the African Free Trade uh, Area Agreement. Um, I'm very hopeful about the potential of that singular initiative. Impressed also with the, what you've done with respect to the payment system to promote intra-Africa trade so that we don't have to depend on a third-party currency. Many things that he's done. I think if there's if it's anybody that is qualified to address the topic of today's lecture, is our guest lecturer. So what I would therefore do is just get out of the way so that we can take and listen to our guest lecture for this morning. Thank you very much and good morning again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. All right, the hour we have all been waiting for. I like the quietness. Yes, when you say the hour we've all been waiting for and everywhere just goes quiet, that means the question is quite high from the lecturer this morning. Um, I like the fact that um, the chairman had begun interrogating the paper even before it is delivered. Uh, something he said that is very key to me is the question he asked when he said, why is the continent not attracting the capital? I don't have answers for you there. Don't look at me like I have answers. No, I don't have the answers. Professor Benito Uruma Rama will do justice to those questions when it comes. Like I did say, this is the time we've been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let's uh, tie our seat belts because something is indeed about to happen right now. As I call for the video of the man of the moment, Professor Benedict Orama. Let's take a listen as we invite him to the table. A citation of Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, CONFCIB. Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, CONFCIB, is the President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of African Export Import Bank, Afrexim Bank. He was born in Ahwada, Nigeria, on July 24, 1961, and attended Merchants of Light School, Oba, in Anambra State, Nigeria, where he earned a distinction in the West African School Certificate Examination in 1978. He graduated with honors in agricultural economics from the University of Ibadan in 1983. He obtained a Master of Science degree in agricultural economics in 1987 and a PhD in the same discipline in 1991 from the Obafemi Aolowo University, OAU, Ileife. Professor Orama was a United Company of Nigeria UACN scholar at the University of Ibadan and a postgraduate fellow at the Obafemi Aolowo University. He obtained an Advanced Management Certificate from Columbia Business School USA in 2015 and became a Professor of International Trade and Finance at Adeleke University, Nigeria in 2018. In December 2019, he received an Honorary Doctor of Science degree in Agricultural Economics from the Obafemi Aolowo University, Ileife, Nigeria. In March 2022, he received an honorary doctorate degree in development economics at the Namdi Azikiwe University, Oka. Before joining Afrexim Bank in 1994, Professor Orama worked at the Nigerian Export Import Bank, Nexim. Having risen through the ranks from chief analyst and special assistant to the first president of the bank to a senior director and executive vice president, he was appointed to the position of president and chairman of the board of directors of African Export Import Bank, Afrexim Bank, in 2015, a position he holds to date. As president of the Continental Exim Bank, he has demonstrated 
creativity, enterprise, and leadership. In less than a decade of stewardship, Professor Orama has transformed Afrexim Bank into a globally and continentally important institution. A recent Fitch Ratings report noted that Afrexim Bank has become a principal driver of economic transformation and a vital instrument for implementing the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFC-FTA. In less than seven years, he grew Afrexim Bank's assets and guarantees from about 5 billion US dollars in September 2015 to more than 30 billion US dollars in 2022 and grew annual revenues from 400 million US dollars in 2015 to about 1.5 billion US dollars in 2022. Creating a sizable pan-African institution has rendered Afrexim Bank pivotal to managing global shocks in Africa. For instance, in 2016-2017, when the commodity crisis broke, Afrexim Bank disbursed over 10 billion US dollars into Africa and 2.2 billion US dollars into Nigeria. Between 2020 and 2022, the bank disbursed an aggregate of about 20 billion US dollars to contain the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing Ukraine crisis. The bank's investment of 2 billion US dollars into Africa's vaccination program enabled Nigeria and others to secure access to the COVID-19 vaccines, saving numerous lives and livelihoods. Buoyed by a belief in the strategic importance of an Africa-controlled financial system, Professor Orama has led the creation of innovative instruments to support the development of a strong and interconnected continental financial system. Under his leadership, the bank worked with the African Union and the AFC-FTA Secretariat to develop the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, to enable intra-African trade and payments in African currencies, paving the way for achieving annual savings of about 5 billion US dollars in payment charges by Africa. Professor Orama is also leading the bank's efforts to promote intra-African trade through the creation of several novel programs. Under his leadership, Afrexim Bank has created a biennial intra-African trade fair, a premier marketplace for promoting cross-border trade and investments. In collaboration with the African Union and the AFC-FTA Secretariat, the bank under the able leadership of Professor Orama has also created the AFC-FTA Adjustment Fund that will compensate countries for revenue losses that will occur due to the AFC-FTA associated tariff removals and help them adjust smoothly to the implementation of the AFC-FTA and the Afrexim Bank Africa Collaborative Transit Guarantee Scheme. He also created an impact fund and an insurance subsidiary called the Fund for Export Development in Africa, FEDA, and Afrex Insure, respectively. In Nigeria, the presence and impact of Afrexim Bank has been significant. Under his leadership, Afrexim Bank has contributed immensely to strengthening the Nigerian financial sector and supported the growth of the private sector. The bank, under his leadership, is currently developing a 300 million US dollar ultra modern African Medical Center of Excellence, AMCE, in Abuja, which will help transform the country's health and medical services industry, improve healthcare delivery, as well as make Nigeria a regional hub for medical tourism. The bank is also developing an Afrexim Bank Africa Trade Center, AATC, in Abuja which will, among others, house the bank's regional office, a modern conference and an exhibition facility, a tech incubation center, a hotel, and offices for international and pan-African organizations. 
Further, the bank has completed the development of an Africa Quality Assurance Center in Ugu State. This facility is expected to significantly boost the testing and certification of Nigerian goods for exports and domestic consumption. As a prolific writer, Professor Orama has several publications to his credit. He has authored books, contributed chapters to several books on economic development, trade and trade finance, and written several journal articles. The most recent writings are the books on Foundations of Structured Trade Finance, a chapter on Export Credit Administration in Capital-Scarce Developing Countries, Handbook of Global Trade Policy, as well as policy papers on Training to Green Growth in Fossil Export-Dependent Economies, a pathway for Africa in the Global Policy, Wiley, and a Frexim Bank in the era of the AFC-FTA in the Journal of African Trade. Aside from being the Chairman of the Board of Directors of Afrexim Bank, Professor Orama serves on the board of several other organizations. He is the Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Fund for Export Development in Africa, FEDA, the Chairman of the Management Board of Directors of the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, the current Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Arab Africa Trade Bridges, AATB, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the African Union COVID-19 Response Fund. He is also a member of the Intra-African Trade Fair, IATF Advisory Council, a member of the Practitioners Advisory Board of the Institute for Trade and Innovation, IFTI, at Offenberg University, Germany, and a member of the Emerging Markets Advisory Council of the Institute of International Finance. For his contributions to international trade and investments, he received national honors from the governments of Cameroon and Russia in 2019. In 2022, he was decorated with several awards, including the Leadership Person of the Year Award 2022, by the Leadership Magazine, Outstanding Visionary Financial Leader of the Year Award 2022 by GE7 Initiative, and the George Washington University Institute of African Studies African Energy Person of the Year in 2022 by the Africa Energy Chamber, African Banker of the Year Award 2017 and 2022. African Champion of the Year by the Africa CEO Forum 2022 African Bar Association Medal of Merit Leadership Award 2022 and the High Nigerian National Honor of Commander of the Order of the Niger CON by the Government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria Professor Oke Orama is a family man happily married with three daughters Mr. President, Chairman of Council, Distinguished Guests, it is my singular honor and privilege to present to you this visionary and transformational leader, a consummate professional, an outstanding member of the global banking community, a man with the Midas touch, an astute manager of men and resources, Highly distinguished and an accomplished role model, Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, CON FCIB, to deliver the 2023 Annual Lecture of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. Thank you so very much, sir. I'm going to seize the opportunity of a handshake before the lecture. Thank you for the cameras. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony. Let me start by 
recognizing the chairman of this morning's event, Mr. Suleiman Adedotu, the president of the Shadi Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, the past vice president who are here, and all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are here and who have been recognized when the master of ceremony established the initial protocol. I must say that the chairman of the occasion has done part of the job, just as the president of the Chinese Institute of Bankers, who spoke earlier, did. But I've been asked to speak, so I will complete what they started. I'm most grateful to my dear brother and friend, Dr. Ken Opara, for the nice words, and also to the chairperson who has spoken so eloquently about the subject matter of today's discussion. I'm most highly honored by the opportunity to deliver this year's annual Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria lecture on a topic that has huge implications for Africa. And part of me when I talk about Africa, because my job is about Africa, so I speak a lot about Africa. I thank the leadership of CIBN for going to great lands to accommodate my rather complex schedule. I know that this lecture was rescheduled once. I apologize for that, but thank them for the honor of being able eventually to deliver it. The Chilean Institute of Bankers of Nigeria has an invaluable record of leading the debate on issues that matter to Nigeria and indeed Africa. I'm proud to be a fellow of the Institute. I thank Pastor Chairman Uche for making that possible and all the governing council who also made it possible. I take this event as an opportunity to enrich the contributions of the CIBN towards strengthening Africa's and Nigeria's financial system. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the kernel of the argument I'll be making today is aptly captured in a statement made recently by the President of Ghana, His Excellency President Akufuado, and I quote, we in Africa have the manpower, we should have the political will, it is time to make Africa work. If we stop being beggars, and spend African money inside the continent, Africa will not need to ask for respect from anyone. We will get the respect we deserve if we make it, as if we make Africa prosperous as it should be. Respect will follow. Central to that seemingly ordinary but deep admonition is that we should quit our beggarly attitudes 
and strive to spend Africa's money inside Africa if we hope to achieve prosperity and earn the respect we all deserve. That thesis throws up two critical questions that set the stage for my presentation today. First, why are Africans still hooked on grants and begging all the time, despite over 60 years of independence? Second, why is African money spent outside Africa and by whom? Africa's development experience has proven beyond any doubt that grants cannot finance prosperity, that we cannot spend what we do not control, and that ownership of resources does not necessarily translate to their control. In other words, an owner of a resource may actually beg the controller of that resource to grant him or her access to that resource. I call this humiliating situation that Africa finds itself in the poverty in wealth paradox. It is no wonder that although Africa has foreign exchange reserves amounting to about $500 billion, about half of Africa's external debt today, stashed away in foreign banks, the same African countries, owners of these funds, cannot easily borrow them from the same foreign banks that hold the resources, sometimes on the excuse of country risk or compliance complications, issues that are never mentioned when the funds are being deposited in the first place. It is in the context of the foregoing that the topic of today's lecture Unlocking the constraints to Africa's economic transformation, insights into the power of capital is apt and opportune. Without a doubt, capital represents the foundation on which a viable economic transformation can be built. I think our chairman emphasized this when he spoke. I will quickly add that while ownership of capital is necessary, it is its control that provides the sufficient condition for capital to become an effective factor of production that can deliver development. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was the economist Robert Solow who in 1956 reduce the question of the drivers of economic growth to a simplified model that specified that output was a function of labor and capital. The question was simple but profound when it was set out, and perhaps even explains why slavery ended, the theoretical explanation to that, as well as the colonial strategy that de-industrialized Africa. I will explain. The first industrial revolution led by Britain began in the mid 1700s. Machines began to replace labor in the production of textiles and other goods. Production also became aggregated, which fostered efficiency gains but nonetheless, cheap labor hitherto provided by slaves became a competitor that had to be dealt with if the use of machines was to spread. 
Accordingly, agitation to abolish slavery began a few years after, culminating its abolition by Britain in 1808. And as the superpower of the time, Britain enforced that abolition around the world. We must all therefore realize that it was economics that ended slavery and not a, not a sudden fear of God. So, the end of slavery was a classic case of the struggle between labor and capital and which owners of capital won over the owners of slave labor. Even, even after the end of slavery, that struggle continued in Europe, leading to the emergence of socialism, fueled by the work of Karl Marx in 1867, titled The Capital. In that hugely consequential work, Marx argues that, I quote, the motivating force of capitalism is the exploitation of labor whose unpaid work produces surplus value. It is that same motivating force of capitalism that explains the strategy adopted by the colonial masters at the onset of colonialism. That strategy had been, had been so effective that it is perhaps at the root of the development challenges Africa faces even today, more than six decades since independence. Abbas Sarau, a colonial administrator in the 1920s, aptly outlined that strategy, and I'll quote him. Economically, a colonial possession means to the home country simply a privileged market once it withdraws the raw materials it needs, dumping its own manufacturers in return. Economic policy is reduced to rudimentary procedures of gathering crops and battering them. Moreover, by strictly imposing on its colonial dependency the exclusive consumption of its manufactured products, the metropolis prevents any efforts to use or manufacture local raw materials on the spot. And any contact with the rest of the world, and any contact with the rest of the world, the colony is forbidden to establish any industry, to improve itself by economic progress, to rise above the stage of producing raw materials, or to do business with the neighboring territories for its own enrichment across the customs barriers erected by the metropolitan powers." Unquote. You agree with me that there can be no better explanation as to why Africa became a continent of atomistic and fragmented states. You need no further research to find out why, for decades, Africa could hardly trade among itself. Why Africans could hardly invest across borders. And why Africa, so rich in natural resources, could not accumulate the capital needed to finance its development. It is that strategy that explains why the African banking system is today dominated by foreign banks and therefore unable to act as an agent for capital accumulation within Africa. It is as a result of this historical reason that the banking system is the weakest link in Africa's development journey. Banks are expected to play a critical intermediation role, mobilizing savings, 
from capital surplus entities and deploying them efficiently across the economy. The other, they also offer other critical services such as payment and trade services and so on. They can also attract foreign capital through borrowings and other fund mobilization activities. But empirical evidence has shown that foreign-owned banks have not been able to perform these roles effectively in developing countries. That answers a bit some of the questions that the chairman asked earlier. Why are we not attracting even the capital that is out there? The institutions that are supposed to do that are not the right institutions. The primary goal in any economy is to support the business. The primary goal of the foreign banks in any economy is to support the business of their home companies. And that is understandable. When a foreign bank establishes the first people they support are their business, the businesses from where they came from. Mobilizing savings, especially from the rural areas, is the least of their priorities. Supporting local corporates and SMEs is usually reduced to corporate social responsibility rather than a business proposition. It is done to satisfy the regulator. Not that for them it is something to be done to make money out of. Granting of credit favors their home companies for the simple reason that any credit committee will be wary of new names, let alone an exotic one. And major credit decisions in subsidiaries of foreign banks based in Africa are usually made in their respective headquarters outside the continent, compounding the exotic name problem. So while Africa may be rich in natural resources, leveraging the wealth is determined by those who control the capital required to bring them to market. It is therefore important that we build a domestic financial system that welcomes foreign banks, but which as a deliberate policy must have the strong participation of Africa-owned banks. I made this proposal further supported by leading economists' arguments, such as Joseph Stiglitz, who have variously argued that overdependence on foreign capital is a bane of most developing countries. Many have argued that foreign capital increases the risk of economic volatility and elevates the incidences of imported crisis and vulnerability to global shocks. Also, reliance on foreign capital reduces government autonomy over fiscal policy, reduces the scope for the growth of the domestic banking system, weakens the competitiveness of manufacturing industries, and shrinks capacity of locally owned contractors who do not benefit from foreign capital support to build for and execute national and regional projects. The experience of Asian economies presents valuable lessons on this subject. The economist Edwin Rubens, in his work on Japan's economic emergence, wrote, and I quote, Despite the difficult oriental conditions that faced Japan, that faced Japan she succeeded in, in, in carrying out a continuous cumulative development. This process was only partly a planned government-sponsored effort. 
Japan did not rely upon foreign capital to take all the steps and foot all the bills. Unquote. It is now known that the key to the transformation of successful Asian economies was control of their own domestic financial system. In China, foreign banks accounted for only 1.3% of the banking industry assets as of 2016. In India, it was 6.2%. Similarly, in the Republic of Korea, the share was 5%. 13% in Russia, and 15% in Brazil. This has come in short that these economies were able to use domestic policies to direct capital into national priority sectors and activities. So also made it possible for banks to be able to take risks in those sectors. Another critical factor that catalyzed the success of Asian economies is the creation of sizable and well-capitalized special development finance institutions, the so-called policy banks, that acted as superstructures that massively supported economically impactful projects and sectors. The Chinese government, for instance, Created China Development Bank, also China Exim Bank in 1994, China Export Credit and Insurance Corporation, China Show in 20, 2001, as the vehicles to prepare the country's transformation. The Korean economic miracle since the early 1970s was partly a result of financial sector reforms and also the refocusing a reorientation of national trade and development finance institutions, including the Korea Development Bank in 19, that was created in 1954, the Industrial Development Bank that was created in 1961, the Korea Exim Bank 1976, and later the Korea Trade Insurance Corporation in 1992. The total assets of the two Chinese development banks represented 23% of the 2020 GDP of China, estimated at $14.7 trillion. The development bank's assets, asset share of GDP was 19% for South Korea and 9% for Brazil. The experience of African countries has been different from those of the Asian economies. Since the era of, <clears throat> of the colonial rule, Foreign capital has been a dominating force in Africa, increasing in intensity after the introduction of the IMF-sponsored structural adjustment program that led to the liberalization of the financial sector of most African economies between 1980s and early 2000s. With that liberalization, nation development financial institutions were largely shut down while inflation wiped out the capital of domestic banks, paving the way for foreign banks to fill the void. As a result, the share of banking industry assets held by foreign banks rose from 34% in 1995 to about 66% in 2008 and 73% in 2010. However, since the early 2010s, a combination of factors began to shrink the share of foreign banks on the continent. But this experience varied from country to country. In some countries, foreign, uh, the share of uh, banking assets held by foreign banks still exceeded 80%. It's only a few countries such as Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, that the share is 20% or less. So what becomes obvious to you from this is that Americans control American banks. 
Europeans control European banks. Chinese control Chinese banks. Indians control Indian banks. Brazilians control Brazilian banks. But only in Africa that others control African banks. Despite recent gains, Africa's financial system remains small, fragmented, and weak relative to other regions. African multilateral financial institutions are also among the least capitalized among peers in the global financial system. The five regional continental financial institutions hold combined capital of $17 billion, which is only 0.7% of Africa's 2020 GDP. Compare it to what um, I reported earlier for China, Korea, and Brazil. Their combined total assets amounted to about $85 billion in 2020, which was only 3.5% of Africa's GDP in that same year. In relative terms, that's the share, the, the share if, you, if you want to calculate the percent of um, the African develop, multilateral development banks in terms of a relative share of the assets also held by banks in China and Korea, you will see that they are just very, very marginal. There is no way that a continent that wants to develop itself, which requires capital, as that weak link can be financed or can get out of poverty with this scenario. The consequences of the fragilities of Africa's financial system is the increased level of reliance on foreign capital for all aspects of economic activities. As a result, Africa has become very vulnerable to the global shocks. Economic volatility has increased significantly and the power of governments to deploy policies to drive infrastructure and industrial development has been severely eroded. As a result, many African economies remain commodity dependent with the rich resource endowments serving the purpose of others rather than Africans. It is to begin to reverse this sorry situation that African multilateral financial institutions were created to mobilize capital both within and outside Africa and to deploy them mainly to serve Africa's purpose and interests. In other words, they are to serve as a platform for ownership and control of capital that Africa needs to develop. That is central in the purpose of the multilateral financial institutions that have been created. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, African Bank's own experience demonstrates what is possible if we diligently implement that strategy and if we strengthen our financial institutions and use them as agents to unleash economic transformation through the power of capital. Permit me to cite a few examples. From 2015 to 2017, the commodity supercycle ended, and many commodity dependent countries went into difficulties. International banks cut credit lines to Africa, and many African economies faced the possibility of defaulting on their trade debt payment obligations. A present bank stepped in and launched a special program called the Countercyclical Trade Liquidity Facility, through which it disbursed over $10 billion to many African central and commercial banks helping to avert potentially catastrophic default situation at that time. 
Nigeria has received about $3.5 billion of those funds. In 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, international banks once again cut credit lines to Africa. At a time, unprecedented credit lines were required to procure personal protective equipment, test kits, therapeutics, food and fertilizers, and to pay a backlog of trade debt payments obligations that were falling due. And Fresen Bank once again contributed significantly to filling the gap, disbursing an aggregate amount of about $8 billion during 2020 under, the, under its pandemic threat impact mitigation facility. And when the COVID-19 vaccines became available, it became a game of numbers and the size of your wallet. It was also everyone for himself or herself. And so financing, and no financing was available to support Africa's sourcing, African sourcing vaccines. Again, because there was an African bank, the African Union's African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team was able to negotiate 400 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, which a present bank underwrote at a level of $2 billion, <laughs> making, making it the first time ever Africa achieved a pooled procurement of an emergency product underwritten by an African bank. And I must say a few words about this. It wasn't only that there was that capital was not available. In fact, in many countries, their banks were advised not to finance anybody who wanted to borrow money to buy vaccines. So it wasn't even about availability, it was about nationalism. And the reason for that was that vaccines were scarce. So countries use whatever mechanisms they had to ensure they had access and they prevented the others from having access until they had their own. If we needed uh, any wake-up call as to make ourselves stronger, that was the wake-up call. And in a few months, the Dangote Refinery and Petrochemical Plant will become operational. Becoming the largest single, uh, the largest single train refinery in the world, and one of the largest nitrogen fertilizer and petrochemical plants in the world. That more than fourteen billion dollar project has advanced in a most difficult time because our Fresen Bank and Nigerian banks backed it. The development of a $2.9 billion hydroelectric dam project has commenced in Tanzania. Thanks to the financing arranged by a Fresen Bank and supported by a number of African commercial banks. The Rufuji Dam, being developed solely by African contractors from Egypt, completely ceded to them. If we hope to drive our development in our desired direction. And it is important to point out that our president has been able to make these modest contributions because it is largely African in ownership and control. And African governments have been steadfast in meeting its capitalization needs, making it possible for management to deliver on the collective vision. How do we ensure greater African control of our banking system? You may then ask. How do we make Africa-owned financial institutions capable and effective? Permit me 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to first outline a president's contribution towards that end before making broad suggestions. Our view at our Flexing Bank is that the current voluntary exit of many international banks from Africa should not be of concern to us and should, in fact, be seen positively. Our Flexing Bank has developed a strategy to ensure that capable African investors acquire the local subsidiaries of these international banks that are being sold. We have so far supported acquisitions amounting to $800 million, and we are well advanced in doubling that under our intra-African investment financing facility. Ensuring that capable African entities, preferably operating banks, acquire these subsidiaries, we lay the foundation for African banks to effectively play their wealth creating roles on our continent. Our Bank has also expanded and intensified its lines of credit and trade services offerings designed to support local banks to properly serve their clientele. We have made sure that uh, that that becomes universal, targeting about 500 of the 600 regulated African banks. Our aim is to grant trade services lines of up to $8 billion under the African Bank Trade Facilitation Facility. We are also intensifying efforts towards mobilizing African foreign exchange reserves and using them to support Africa better. We created the Africa Resource Mobilization Unit, which implements our central bank deposit program and other deposit mobilization activities from African sources. An aggregate amount of about $33 billion have been mobilized since 2017 when we established, when we started this effort. It is still a paltry amount, considering the almost $500 billion Africa holds in the foreign exchange reserve. But we think it's a good beginning. We have also deliberately used this instrument to better diversify our sources of liability so that we are not 100% dependent on, on outside markets. Today, from almost 100%, we now have African sources contributing about 33% of our liabilities. Repo markets exist in Europe, the US, and many other markets to support, trading, to, to support the trading of their bonds, including Euro bonds. Africa had historically lacked that infrastructure, with the consequence that euro bonds issued by African entities are priced below what their peers attract. This is about to change. As our present bank working with the UN Economic Commission for Africa has established a repo window called the Liquidity and Sustainability Facility working with the Bank of New York, Mellon, and Citibank, the first deals were done late last year, and activities are gradually ramping up. It is a vital financial market infrastructure that may over time support local bond issuances, strengthen our debt capital markets, and give us better control over our capital. We also believe that it is strong African currencies that can sustain a viral and vibrant African banking sector. The Pan-African Payment and Settlement System presents an instrument that will domesticate all inter-African trade payments, which will serve to strengthen 
African currencies. In addition, PAPS has entered into an arrangement with the African Stock Exchange Association that will make it possible to regionalize selected African stock exchanges and improve liquidity. This will make it possible for listed African banks to attract investments from across Africa, which will help strengthen their capital base. Training, capacity building, and advocacy are instruments the bank is also deploying to strengthen Africa controlled banks because excellence in management is a critical success factor for the banking system we deserve. Beyond all of these, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, more needs to be done at all levels to realize the ambitions of a well-functioning African financial system with strong participation of African controlled and Africa-owned banks. At the continental level, the AFCFTA protocol on services should at some point consider the possibility of banking, of um, portability of banking licenses so that banks can operate across borders seamlessly. Banking regulations should also be harmonized. The goal should be to make every African bank a domestic bank anywhere they wish to operate. That way they can be stronger and compete better against foreign-owned banks. There's also the need to accelerate the creation of the African Central Bank, which will champion the continent-wide institutional reforms that will support an integrated banking and financial system. The African Central Bank project still faces hurdles. The draft protocol for the establishment of the Central Bank has yet to be submitted to the African Union Assembly. As a selected headquarters of the Central Bank, Nigeria should support the African Union Champion for Financial Institutions his Excellency President Nana Akufa Ado of Ghana in accelerating this project. African governments and central banks should also make deliberate efforts to strengthen their banking systems. Nigeria's experience in that direction can serve as a guide. The implementation of local content policies must be such as to support the use of local banks in implementing big projects within Africa. In addition, governments should consider creating national development finance institutions under a governance arrangement that minimizes government and political interference. It is important that those that are operating, in this case in Nigeria, Nexim, Bank of Industry, uh, the Development Bank of Nigeria, that are, they are strongly and properly capitalized so that they can play their role as their peers are doing in Asia and other parts of the world. It's not enough to just create the institutions, but we must equip them if we want to make sure we use them to finance our development. Support for African regional financial institutions is also crucial. And that should be in the form of increasing their capital and also strengthening their management where necessary. Also, governments must become, must promote strong local content regulations, as I mentioned. And the experience of Nigeria uh, is something I think others should be made aware of so that they can adopt. Africa should wake up to the fact that there's no free lunch. Building a vibrant banking sector and taking control of our capital will cost money. And we must be willing to pay for it. 
and invest in it to realize the remarkable return it promises. This will require a deliberate decision to capitalize multilateral financial institutions in Africa, such as our Fresen Bank and other fin uh, financial institutions. The benefits will be much more than the cost. Africa-owned banks who have an important role to play also have an important role to play in the form of strengthening their management, mobilizing capital, and pursuing their commercial goals while bearing in mind the development imperatives of their being. I think commercial banks, while they make money, they must also understand that they are agents of development. African banks should collaborate more, more often, share information and knowledge, and be strong and engage in fair competition whenever they find, wherever they find themselves. And while African banks operate across their borders within Africa, they must make sure they avoid the paradox I mentioned. They must make sure they go in with local partners so that they can serve the purpose of the countries where they are located more effectively. As I conclude, please permit me to again thank the leadership of the Chita Institute of Bankers for the opportunity of delivering this lecture. Let me also thank those who organized the event today and express my also appreciation to the chairman for coming and all of you who spare the time for your very busy schedules to be here. The main message I wanted to convey today is that capital is critical for the development agenda we are pursuing. Where we have abundant supply of labor, the only thing we don't have is capital. But we have the wealth. The problem with us is more of the control of what we have rather than the ownership of that. For years, we've had this world where the world has benefited others who control them. We must change that now. We must control what we have and use it to finance our development. Use it to accumulate more capital so that we can become competitive in the world. I think the message is Africa first. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Let's keep the applause. Let's keep the applause. Let's keep the applause. Thank you so very much, Professor Benedict Orama. Wonderful, insightful, educating. Our lecture, I must say, thank you so very much. Thank you. We can, now, we can all now sit. Thank you. We will be interrogating the lecture, no doubt. I'm sure um, we have a few questions uh, to ask uh, the lecturer this, this beautiful day. Uh, but for me, uh, my takeaway was exactly on how he began the conversation, uh, on the background to which he began the conversation. He did say, Africans should quit beggarly attitude. He also did say, spend Africa money in Africa. That speaks to quite a number of us here. And he also did say, grants can't finance prosperity. I think it deserves a round of applause. Thank you so very much, Professor Benedict. It is indeed my honor to have you, uh, have you in person today. I'm excited seeing you today. Those, those pictures I snapped, you won't believe where you'll get to after this show. Uh, trust me. Uh, thank you once again. Um, before we ask questions, it's, it's okay to interrogate the paper, sir. It's okay. A few questions for you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, let's uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. Kenneth Teter.
He is um, the Group Chief Executive Officer, Century Energy. Thank you so very much for coming, sir. Thank you so very much. I, I will do this as quickly as I can, uh, but please, if I don't mention your name, hold me responsible and not the CIBN. Um, Mr. Oscar Onyema had just left. I saw him earlier, earlier today. Es Oscar Onyema is the Group Managing Director of um, the Nigerian uh, Exchange Group, NGX. Um, we have representatives of the Oba of, of Lagos here. We call them um, uh, our royal fathers. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you so very much for coming. Dr. Shei Awojabi, former registrar, I saw him somewhere outside a while ago. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Tundelemo, thank you so very much. Uh, I thought you had retired uh, after you left the Central Bank until I realized that you are still the chairman of Titan Trust Bank. Sir, he needs to rest some more. Thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you so very much. Professor Inase Okenedo, VC, Pan-African University, we, are, we acknowledge your presence here. Thank you so very much. Uh, let me mention a few bank MDs that we have here. We have the MD of EcoBank, uh, Mr. Bolaji Lawal, FCIB. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Nath uh, Uday. Uh, MD, uh, Nova Merchant Bank, thank you. Mr. Olufemi Bakare, uh, FCIB, MD, uh, Parallax Bank. Uh, Mr. Wubaka Suleiman, FCIB, MD, Stalin Bank. I, oh, he's also left. Okay, he went to the bathroom. I'm sure he'll be back in, in a bit. Um, Mr. Bankole Smith, FCIB, MD, FC, FCMB Bank. Uh, Mr. Demola, DBC, FCMB, FCIB, MD, Wem Bank. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, Mr. Jene Dalo. Dalo, yes, I met Dalo a while ago when he was coming in. Dalo is the MD CEO of um, a Rand, Rand Merchant Bank. Thank you, Dalo. Dalo, can I just do this? Thank you. You know, I like that name, Dalo. Uh, a lot of you don't know how it's pronounced. Dalo means thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't know how easy it's coined, but it could be Chuku Dalo, which means thank you, Lord or Dalu Chuku, which could mean God thank you. Am I doing very well? Thank you very much. I deserve a round of applause, gentlemen. Thank you. So at this point in time, I would call a few other names uh, before the program uh, runs to a close. But then, um, we, we, know, we know that there will be questions. We know you have quite a number of questions. But uh, for want of time, we have streamlined the questions to just about three individuals this morning. And um, in no particular order, with no preferential treatment, we have screened the numbers to just three. Um, let me invite my father, uh, my adopted father, Dr. Uh, Tundelemo. I'm sure he has a question for Professor Benito Rama. Can we take the mic to Dr. Tundelemo? Yes, the mic is by you, sir. The chairman of the occasion, Mr. Dr. Sulat, Professor Orama, the guest lecturer. Mine is not a question, but a few comments. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for the lecture. Very, very uh, detailed. And indeed, all of us have taken copious notes, and I know that we're really impressed with the depth of the lecture. Um, for me, the insights you have given today uh, is very, very profound, particularly the case study that you gave. And I want to testify that you walk your talk because my institution has benefited from, you know, those things that you listed out. And indeed, uh, we're very proud uh, that Afrexim made it happen for us uh, to be part of the acquisition that we made, the details of which are in the uh, public domain. I will also say that for all of the things you have mentioned, something is very, very critical in attracting capital, and that's good governance. Because if you must attract capital globally, country risk is very important. I mean, there are bankers here. Many of us have run our institutions to a point that they are triple A. But when you get international rating agencies, they say they will not give you international rating that is superior to the country rating. So all of us must continue to carry out the advocacy that our fortune is tied to the, our country's fortune so that we can be part of that change that we all need. And then, of course, the importance of capital also extends to the fact that we have embedded in Africa capital that cannot be used. Uh, I think it was the Peruvian economist, Fernando de Soto, that wrote the book, Ministry of Capital. 
where he said that if we will look back, and this goes to many of us here, bankers, and ensure that we decouple this and we secretize most of the things we have, it will be easier for us to access capital. And thirdly, Nigeria banks are doing well, and I thank God for my former boss, Professor Soludo, who led that you know, initiative to ratchet up capital. I'm proud to have been part of that initiative. But we need to do more by making sure that, because we know Africa better than the foreign institutions, we identified eligible projects, and like Afrezim has done, like ADB, AFC have also done, we can then identify these, put down our capital, but then lead, you know, the consortium of other foreign banks in, in attracting their attention to the potentials that are in Africa. They are over there, they can't see the details as much as we see it. So if we can incubate many of those projects, they will largely be above our capital threshold, but then we can lead out in ensuring we make that. And once again, thank you very much, Professor Benorama, for the leadership role you're playing in deploying uh, capital yeah. to Africa. And yeah. I believe that uh, we are listening, we've taken copious notes, and we'll also follow suit. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Tundilemo. Um, that wasn't the question, it was an intervention. So, uh, Prof, you are not um, obliged to respond to that. Um, let, me, let me invite Professor Enase Okenedo uh, for a question, if she's still here. Professor, please get the mic across to Prof. Thank you. Thank if you, you oblige me, Prof, let's make it as brief as, as possible. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Just to join in commending our guest lecturer this morning for a most enlightening lecture in which you have emphasized the power of capital to unleash Africa's economic transformation. I noticed that when you were making your speech, you did end with um, specific policy suggestions, but recognizing that across Africa, the needs are varied. I wonder whether you could speak a bit as to what can be prioritized on the macro level in terms of your suggested interventions, which cuts across, of course, the financial resources, but also we have the policy reforms that are essential to deepening and strengthening the financial system and then human capital. On a macro level for the desired transformation to unleash capital, what should be prioritized? Thank you. Thank you so very much, Prof. Thank you so very much. And finally, let me invite Mr. Femi Ekundayo, FCIB, for his question or intervention. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. President, and distinguished participants, with particular reference to our special guest speaker. My name is Femi Ekundayo, the past president of CIPA. And I'd like to place on record my sincere appreciation of uh, the guest speaker particularly when we see Nigerians making Nigeria proud across the globe. We are very proud of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Prof, mine are just two basic questions. The, the first is the effort being made by Africa are quite um, appreciated. But to what extent do you think that the dominance of Paris in the financial system of Francophone countries would impact the early accomplishment of your goal? Now, uh, because we know we run into some problem in this area. My second question is, what could be the impact of inter and intra collaboration among African banking institutions? We can come take an example from Nigeria. Most of the Nigerian banks are doing very well, but often get preoccupied consolidating their own positions. And those practices of the past, in the 80s and 90s, whereby banks collaborate with themselves to be able to do greater things. I'm going to be challenged now with uh, the FC FTA. To what extent do you think that we can re-energize inter and inter-collaboration among banks? Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir. 
Um, okay, so Prof, uh, you have just one question to respond to. You want to do it there or you want to come here and do it here? Fantastic. Please help us together for Prof. Well, thank you very much for those questions. I think somehow they are related. I think the professor, I, I, I couldn't get her name. And I say, uh, what you're asking is at the macro level, what, what I thought would be the priority. Is that, um, I didn't go into that because I took that as given. Uh, because it cuts across whether you have a foreign-owned foreign, foreign -owned banks operating in the economy and, or whether you have domestic banks. Although, for the domestic banks that are small, fragile, try to rise in, the importance of having a stable, predictable macroeconomic environment is critical. I think the issue is that banks would thrive, just like any other business, where uncertainties are reduced, where the uh, macroeconomic policies and the outcomes are predictable to the operators. And we are those who deal with those institutions can also predict them uh, because that is what we determine whether they make an investment or they do not make investments. That will determine how they assess the risks of what they are doing. So the, the most critical thing is um, the, uh, the fiscal and monetary policies uh, that government um, implement. And not only uh, is it uh, necessary that they become, they achieve stability, they help us achieve stability and predictability. But I also use the word several times in my speech, deliberate policy, deliberate. Uh, there are uh, deliberate policies the government can make to make sure certain activities uh, become successful. Uh, especially when you when they consider that they are starting from a very weak point. Um, many, in many African countries, foreign banks dominate. The domestic banks that are there are struggling. They, are, they do not have the capital, um, and they do not have even the, the right manpower to be able to operate and compete effectively with the foreign banks. So governments in those countries should recognize that and also make sector-specific policies uh, that uh, address those weaknesses, knowing that they are being made to uh, make sure that the sector rises. And these would normally be temporary interventions until uh, you, you achieve the results that are seeking. So essentially, uh, macroeconomic stability is a necessary condition and is the first. Uh, otherwise, no business can really thrive. Um, you, you see what happens also. When you have inflation, uh, the capital of banks are wiped out. Uh, then when the capital of banks are wiped out, the, the banks start struggling to uh, to build back the capital, and they are not able to uh, to become the agents for mobilizing capital. They cannot lend as as they should because they are not. They do not have the capacity to lend. So if you do, if you have an, um, a macroeconomic environment that uh, is not that inflationary, um, you you achieve that. But if it is a situation where prices are rising and, of course, exchange rates and all, all, everything uh, very, very unstable. Um, it takes, um, uh, I don't know who, to be able to operate in such an environment and do so, um, and do so well, of course. Uh, there are other things. Um, the, the regulatory framework, uh, making sure also uh, that even certain regulations that are adopted in such a way that the regulator recognizes the initial conditions in the country. 
Uh, that is done in many countries. In Egypt, I know how they do some of the regulators, how they do some of those. Uh, they don't adopt any certain kind of regulations just because they are out there. Um, and even in developed countries, uh, you go and look at how the Americans adopt certain the, the regulations. They don't just adopt. So these are these sensitivities are, are the, the kind of things one should be expecting from the regulator. So it should be a government and a regulatory agency that is development driven. And so that is the way to put it. Uh, and being development driven means it has the, there's a development strategy that everybody is is focused on, and they, and the and each agency operates within that framework. Um, the second question uh, from my brother is, uh, uh, what happened? What how to deal with the francophone countries? Well, th things are changing in francophone countries. Um, it's not the way it used to be. Um, you see how the CFA franc it hasn't gone away, uh, but. If you look at the financial system in some of those countries, you will see that increasingly you are seeing the emergence of um, uh, of locally owned. When I say locally, I mean indigenously owned, African owned um, financial institutions. Uh, it wasn't like that before. In fact, to the extent uh, that those institutions are now taking over the assets of the big French banks that used to be there. I know we financed the acquisition of uh, BMP assets, um, or, uh, finalizing the financing of the acquisition of Societe General assets. Uh, and in fact, it's um, uh, as evidence of the change that's occurring that even that the CEOs of those banks uh, were consulting with us to to determine how those um, how they would do those exits, uh, to make sure that what they are doing is something we support. That is a big change. Um, so changes are happening. Um, there, there will still be some influences. It's a long history, as you can imagine, uh, more than 100 years of uh, history. Uh, it can't just go away overnight. But good thing is that it's beginning to change. And the FCFTA were accelerated. That takes me to your second question. The, you see, there are a number of protocols that have been negotiated under the FCFTA. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is the agreement, but there are protocols. There's the protocol on uh, in trading goods. There's the protocol on trading services. That protocol on trading services, also, yes, we have most, most issues of financial services are negotiated and have been negotiated. That's where the issue of payment have been negotiated. There are things that are pending there. I mentioned something in my speech, um, which we are encouraging banks to also bring their own ideas uh, so that we take them back to the, uh, the Council of Trade Ministers so they can negotiate those and they, be, they enter the, uh, the LFCFT as a protocol uh, uh, for implementation. And this, uh, one of the things that we think should happen is the issue of making it easy for, making it easy for banks to operate wherever they want to operate in Africa. Uh, so if you have a license in one country, it becomes the same license anywhere you go. Um, issue of taxation of, of for certain kinds of services that are provided by financial institutions. Uh, and there are many other things you, you, the financial institutions know better. I think we, we, we've been uh, um, asking for people to come for uh, um, seminars and conferences where we, where we gathering um, some of these views. I think there was a, well, there was a conference that was held in Tanzania recently. Uh, but I think through the study, through the study Institute of Bankers, we will try to more directly involved maybe the Nigerian banks. Uh, so we can also get some, some of your views on what should be negotiated. But we think that the AFCFT provides a good framework for changes that will be beneficial to the African banking system entirely to happen.
Thank you. You can as well just say, this is our friend Zim to the rescue. Can we put our hands together again for our friends in bank? Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, we'll move as fast as we can, no doubt. Mrs. Nike Abodenry, FCIB, she's here representing the Honorable Minister of, uh, of Aviation. Uh, thank you so very much for coming. Thank you for joining us this beautiful day. I did call Mrs. Bukola Mister. I apologize. Mrs. Bukola Smith uh, is the MD, CEO, FSDH. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. I apologize one more time. Yes, we also have um, Elias uh, Igbina Kenzwa. Pardon me. That just came in in a few seconds. I didn't digest the name, but I know it sounds like Igbina Kenzwa. Yes, he is the MD CEO of. Um, uh, Globus Bank. Thank you so very much, sir. I'll come for tutorials if I didn't get the name correctly. Uh, thank you so very much. Yes, we also have the representative of the Minister, Commissioner for uh, Ministry of Commerce, Lagos State and Industry. She's ably represented by Mrs. Uh, uh, Adesino Ellen uh, Titilayo, Director of Commerce from the Ministry of Commerce. Thank you so very much for coming again. So at this point in time, uh, we will need to run as fast as we can. Time is no longer our friend. Um, let me invite for goodwill message, um, Dr. Ebenezer, if you were here, Dr. Ebenezer Onyago, F FCIB, MD, CEO, Zenith Bank, for a goodwill message. Let's put our hands together. Let's put those hands together. Thank you so very much. Permit me to stand on the already established protocol. Uh, first and foremost is to thank our guest lecturer, Professor Okeorama, for that not only insightful uh, lecture, but more like a message of renaissance. Africa needs to wake up. Nobody knows Africa other than Africans. Nobody will take risk in Africa other than Africans. Nobody will know the corners. Like we say it in Wari Palace, the corals other than we Africans. I think he has brought before us a huge challenge. In a way, he took a swipe on the banking industry as a major anchor for accumulation and circulation of capital. But I think the banking industry will not be doing this on, a, on its own. We need the cooperation of all the stakeholders to achieve this. And let me also say that the banking industry is actually trying and there have been a lot of initiatives under the central bank where we have different intervention program, which is uh, being done to provide long-term concessionary funding uh, sources for entrepreneurs. But if you look deeper, and you want to begin to discern in terms of who are those enjoying this capital, you find out that not much of indigenous African businesses or let me say indigenous Nigerian businesses are enjoying it. Therefore, we need a wake-up call too on indigenous African and Nigerian entrepreneurs. We need to come forward. And even talking about coming forward, on the, if you analyze the lecture, Prof is also talking about building strong and stable institutions. Strong and stable institutions that will endure. Because if you take a look at Morgan Stanley Index, there is no African country that is on the developed market index. When you look at the developing market index, you have Egypt and South Africa. And on the frontier market, you have only about six countries. Nigeria is there, out of 54 countries in Africa. So it goes to show that Africa is in their need of capital. And, and let me also say that if you take a look at the G uh, GDP in Africa, Collectively, Africa's GDP is about 2.8 trillion. Relative to the total world GDP, is about less than 3%. If you extend it further to look at the flow of IPOs last year globally, Africa's share of IPO, which is also a source of uh, capital raise, is less than 3%. That goes to show that Africa needs to build stronger institutions that has the capacity to be able to attract capital. Prof also talked about the fact that there is no free lunch. Therefore, we should all be ready 
to pay the price of having to build and accumulate capital and also getting the capital to work. It is one thing for us to make capital valuable. It's another thing for us to ensure that the capital is actually working and earning the desired dividend. It is only by so doing will we see an emerging and rising Africa that will dominate the world. If you compare our population to the world, we account for about 18%. The president of uh, the institute also made reference to the fact that in terms of landmass, Africa accounts for about 20%. So it's a question of having the space, having the weight, and without anything to show for it. So every one of us here has a responsibility to begin to incubate and build and develop the Africa champion of tomorrow. So that once the capital is there, and those who are determined to build bigger and stronger institutions are there, we'll see that together Africa will also begin to accelerate and make progress. Again, we also have institution, I'm sure my good friend Abba is here, the CEO of NESM. We have NESM, we have Bank of Industry in Nigeria providing long-term funding. But I think having listened to Prof. Abba, you need to look at your model again. So we need to begin to consider issues of risk sharing instead of risk transfer. So by so doing, when we have risk sharing arrangement, it means everybody's skin is in the game. And collectively, when we bear a risk together, you see that we'll be able to hold ourselves and we'll create stability even when the wind is contrary. So I want to thank Prof and also thank the Institute for organizing this lecture and coming on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Institute. You could not have chosen a better person other than our Prof. And let me also testify to the fact that in the year of the COVID, we were talking to some banks where we have already signed contracts for them to give us some placement. These placements were just for one year. What happened in the year of the COVID? They all started pulling back. He took a phone call from me to Prof and said, do you have any funding arrangement? And he said to me, because of COVID, we are going to develop a program that will provide long-term funding. And indeed, they provided a three-year funding. And I stand here to say that Zenith Bank is one of the beneficiaries of that program. <laughs> so that became, it constituted a bragging right. Today, when I'm talking to the foreign banks, I take my time to look at the offer. If you, don't, if you are not giving me two years, I'll tell you keep it there, because I know where I need to go to when I need a long-term funding. So the place to go to for me remains Afrezim Bank. <laughs> so I must thank you for your Pan-African disposition. You are not just saying it, but you are living it. And where all of us are prepared to queue behind you as you execute this very laudable African agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Ebenezer Onyago is also the chairman of the board of bank, uh, bank CEO. So he did speak for virtually all the banks, even though he, he sold his own market too, sure. It's, it's OK. It's OK. All right. Um, yes, let me invite, let me invite uh, our next uh, speaker for the goodwill message. Um, I'll run away from pronouncing the name. You do me the honors. When you come, let's have the, the right pronunciation of the name. So I don't murder uh, that name. He's a representative of the Taipei Trade Office. Please come. Thank you. So can we pronounce together for him? Thank you. Thank you. Please, can we still, can we continue with the clap? Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a ex I mean, been a pleasure and privilege to be um, invited and come here to speak to such a prominent group of financial and banking specialists. So first of all, I will not uh, constrain myself for the protocol procedure, although I'm a trained diplomat from Taiwan, but let me just skip all those kind of uh, protocol and come straight to the goodwill message and what I need to say today. Um, I have asked my colleague that come from my office to put a three minutes constraining order so that I will finish everything in, within three minutes. 
So first of all, thank you so much, uh, President uh, Ken Opara of NTIB, and also a listening to such a distinguished professor of Africa Airport Import Bank, um, Professor Omara. And also, I would like to mention two things. Taiwan has been regarded as the top 20 trading economy in the world, and also the top ranking of information technology, especially on microchip. So the smallest, tiniest microchip that manufactured in the whole world are made in Taiwan. From your mobile phone, to the satellite, to the jet fighter, to aircraft carrier, to submarine made from the US, they depend on the core technology of Taiwan microchip. What made us into this uh, stage? Taiwan might be the perfect model of non-oil economy because we have no natural resources at all. We envy Nigeria so much, but we have only human resources. So we invest in education and we invest in all kinds of economic development and come to this stage. I can be happy to report to you that uh, the governor, His Excellency Governor of Edo State, Mr. Gowen uh, Obafeki, he's now in Taiwan. He had led a delegation to Taiwan to participate the annual event of Smart City International Exposition. And he wanted to build the cooperation between Taiwan and Edo State to promote agriculture and also information technology generated kind of a smart city. And the second thing is that the Czech Republic, the Speaker of the House, Madame Speaker of the House, had led a 160 delegation to Taiwan promoting the cooperation between Czech Republic and Taiwan. And also, several of the US representatives, either from the Congress or the Senate, are visiting Taiwan from frequently because Taiwan has been regarded as the most trustworthy partner for free and democratic world, and also for US military uh, industry. So from all these aspects, demonstrate how Taiwan has survived and also become such a vibrant economy in Asia. We are at the same level of South Korea and also Singapore, but at the same time, Taiwan is such a small island with only 23 million people. If we move all of our population into Lagos, it will vanish. So for, so for us, with no resources, only human, such a small island state, and we can develop ourselves because we focus on trading, technology, and education. So I've been so enlightened by the guest speaker today about how Africa should generate your own capital, your own strength into investing in Africa, but at the same time, through our, all the outsourcing of energy and all kind of investment into Africa, you will prosper, you will get into prosper because we have been through all the stages of development and we have come to this time. So today I'm so happy to um, provide two uh, other resources. First of all, Taiwan and Nigeria have made a very important building block on two things. Your Nigerian uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation had led a delegation to Taiwan. We signed a corporation MOU in 2019. And then Nigeria Airport Import Bank and Taiwan Airport Import Bank has signed an agreement for cooperation to provide $5 million US dollar of trade, uh, uh, a trade, a trade um, a guarantee for, I mean, for, the, for the last two years. So all these building blocks had already been settled and we're coming to more of this kind of building block in the future. So when I see the beautiful picture of the guest speaker speaking to Madame Okonjo Iwera in the World Trade Organization, we are very happy because our delegation in Geneva working closely with her because Taiwan, Nigeria, China, we are all the equal member of the World Trade Organization. So from all the uh, practical information I would like to provide to you. One other thing that our office functioning like a three-in-one, de facto embassy, visa issuing, and also trade mission. So we are very open to all the practical suggestions coming out of your uh, profession background, and we're welcoming any kind of visitor to go to Taiwan anytime from now. 
So thank you again, uh, President Obama, and all the enlightening speeches and uh, all the information for me and my colleague to enjoy. Thank you so much, and we give you our all the good blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, even though we still didn't get the name, um, I was hoping that I would hear. I would hear the name. I wouldn't ask. I wouldn't ask. Uh, anyways, uh, we're running as fast as we can uh, right about now. Can I appreciate the presence of um, uh, the chairman, Autodex uh, Petroleum? Uh, Dr. Uh, Tango Rezani Namdi is here. If you're here, can we just see with a wave? Thank you. Oh, thank you. So good, so good to have you, sir. Uh, we also want to say a very big thank you to all chairmen of um, CIBN uh, uh, you know, branches, physically and uh, virtually. Let's also thank Dr. Oladi Mejialau, FCIB, uh, former MD CEO of FITC. At this point in time, we shall run as fast as we can. Let me invite the registrar and uh, the CEO of CIBN as we have um, the honors of signing the MOU with Afri Exim Bank. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The moment has come when we will be executing the memorandum of understanding between Afrexim Bank and the Charter Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. The president, while speaking, has said that the Africa should no longer be a begging nation, and that begins with education. So on this note, please join me as I welcome up stage the president of Afrexim Bank, our distinguished guest speaker today, Professor Benedict Oke Orama, CON, FCIB, to make his way to this podium for the execution of the MOU. I'd also like to invite the President and Chairman of Council of CIBN, Dr. Ken Okpara, FCIB. Please, let's give them a warm round of applause. The great sage Nelson Mandela once said, the greatest weapon with which you can change the world is education. And so this MOU, May I invite Mrs. Barrister Rita Adeoju for the presentation of the MOU that will be executed. This MOU is to deepen capacity and knowledge of practitioners in the banking and finance industry in the area of trade and finance. And so, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to watch as the distinguished personalities here present execute this memorandum of understanding that will change the landscape in the training and certification of practitioners in the banking industry, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa as a whole. The distinguished presidents are signing, and I'm Longest signature. This is a great moment. This MOU will transform and shape the training and certification area of trade and finance. Thank you very much for signing. I'm unable to see from here who has a long signature, but I'm sure the cameraman can do that for me. And so now we will exchange. OK. So may I now invite the president of Afrexim and the president of CIBN to show the entire world that document which has been signed. And you now have the privilege of seeing who has the longest signature. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Let's celebrate this landmark achievement of the signing of this MOU. You can make it louder if you are happy and excited. You can make it louder. History has not been made today, 29th of March, 2022. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. On behalf of um, the Governing Council of the Chartered Institute of Bankers, 
We are quite excited for the refreshing and exciting presentation you did today. As a token of appreciation, we present this to you. We want you to host this in your office in Cairo as a mark of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. In the same vein, I'd like to invite upstage the chairman of today's occasion, Mr. Adedotu Suleiman. While I request His Excellency to please remain standing. Mr. Adedotu Suleiman, to please come upstage for this quick presentation. Mr. Chairman, please come upstage for this quick presentation, sir. Thank you, sir. The President and Chairman of Council will present, make a presentation to the Chairman of today's event. Okay. To, oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for the honor of presenting um, this uh, on behalf of the Chairman of Bankers to the Chairman of today's event, the distinguished Nigerian professional executive consultant, and so on and so forth. All right. <laughs> So, on behalf of the Chinese of Bankers, I hand this to you for, for the honor you've given us, you know, to find time to join us here today and for the remarks you made. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to request the office holders and the past presidents of CIBN to please step up for group photograph with the distinguished personalities on the top, on the podium. The office holders, the past presidents, to please step up for a group photograph with the president and chairman of council and the president of Afrex Bank. I'd like to humbly request the MD CEOs of banks here present, led by the chairman body of bank CEOs, Dr. Ebenezer Onyago, to please come off stage to have group photograph with the chairman and the president of the IBN while the past presidents can make their way back to their state. The MD CEOs of banks here present to please come off stage. And then last but not the least, I'd like members of the Governing Council to join immediately after this. Members of the Governing Council of CIBN, this is your show. Please come quickly for a good photograph with the distinguished personalities here. Check. Thank you very much. Members of the Governing Council, please flank here. That's the last. There are more pictures after the event is uh, declared officially closed. But let's enjoy this moment as we take the last set of photographs.
I'd like on the special request the, His Excellency the Representative of Taiwan, please come up stage. Mr. Handy, Mr. Andy, please come up stage and have a quick photograph of this distinguished personality. Mr. Andy, everybody. Mr. Andy, please come off stage quickly. This will be the last of the photograph before. Right. Your Excellency's distinguished guest. This will be the last set of photographs and we then swiftly. Thank you very much. Please help me appreciate His Excellency and the distinguished guests as they make this, their way back to this set. Okay. No need. No need. You can use the press for the floor. Thank you very much. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Let's give them a warm round of applause. On this note, I'd like to invite to give the vote of thanks and wrap up remarks the chairman of the organizing and planning committee of this great event. Please join me welcome the amazing Mrs. Oneka Oyalikwe FTIP, Group Managing Director of Fidelity Bank PLC. Please let me hear your resounding applause as she gives the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. The President, Chairman of the Council of CIB and my own Dr. Ken Opara, the Chairman of the occasion of the two 2023 CIBN lecture today, Dr. Dotson Suleiman, MFR, around economic and societal issues. Through this platform, the institution has continued to widen the process of policy formulation and the development of transformational solutions to common challenges in Nigeria and across Africa. It has been of great pleasure and honor to serve as the chairman of this, of this annual lecture implementation committee. And I would like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to the team that worked with me on this. Also, I trust that you had a very engaging session today because the, 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 uh, the professor, Orama, was able to provide inf a lot of information on how policy formulation and support for the financial institutions can drive Africa's economic growth and transformation and position us as one, position Africa as one of the leading economic zones in the world. Also, permit me to thank Dr. Orama especially for this very detailed work and presentation and insightful lecture and also to thank him for leading from the front in what he preaches what he's preaching because he has supported numerous institutions in nigeria and in africa of which yours truly is a, a huge beneficiary so we want to specifically thank him for working his talk today and I'm sure I'm speaking, I'm, I'm speaking for the rest of the industry in Nigeria. I also want to thank very, uh, the chairman of this occasion, Dr. 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 Suleiman, for accepting this invitation. I'll be very late. Thank you, sir. I want to thank all my distinguished guests that made our time to come. Like I said, your time is very expensive and you spend time from your very busy day to spend time with us. We are very grateful. I also want to congratulate the CIBN for this very successful event, the Afro Exim, and, the, uh, and the, 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 for the um, for, for the um, collaboration on the education and um, the formal signing of the of the um, the assistance to, uh, to assist us with the economic development and building the academy. I want to congratulate the CIBN for all the effort they put together for today and to thank all of you once again for coming. Thank you very much.
Can we do better than that? Can we put our hands together for uh, Mrs. Neka? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yes, um, now food is served. The hall is almost empty. Nigerians, can we, can we, can we just be a little bit uh, uh, together? We are rounding up like now. Can I invite Mr. Femi Akundaya for the closing prayer as we round up the program? Can I invite Mr. Femi Akundaya, uh, former past president of CIBN, is here? Kundayo, if you are here, please help us with the prayer. You can do it there. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we glorify your holy name because you started with us and you remain our companion. We thank you for the success of today's event. We also thank you for your omnipresence in the affairs of CIPM. Glory be to your holy name. As we depart to our various vocations, our Lord, you abide with us, grant us protection, and we continue to guide all of those who control the affairs of Nigeria. And your name will be glorified always. Thank you, Father. For in your mighty name, amen. Amen. I'm here, sir. Thank you so very much. So let's, let's wrap up completely with uh, the CIBN anthem as we wrap up the show. In two counts, can we have the CIBN anthem while we say thank you for coming? Gentlemen, have a wonderful day and thank you for being here with us. National anthem. Okay, let's have a national anthem to wrap up finally. The national anthem. Uh -huh.